brings you after the bell in association with betfair welcome to after the bell mirror fighting's boxing show in association with betfair before we get started just a little bit of housekeeping we do stream every week on youtube and facebook if you don't for whatever reason want to watch us you can listen via spotify itunes and all other reputable podcast outlets I know it's boring, but if you do watch or listen, please do rate or subscribe. It really is appreciated. And to keep up to date with any news on the show and fighting in general, please do follow Mirror Fighting on Twitter. Now that's out of the way. I'm Martin Dorman, joined by George Groves and Declan Taylor. Once again, after a relatively quiet weekend in boxing, there was a victory for Epi Ajagba, rising heavyweight star, cruised through 10 rounds, while Jaron Ennis continued to impress at welterweight. 24 stoppages from 26 fights now, very much one to watch. Now, given it's been a quiet weekend, I thought we could get into Floyd Mayweather, Logan Paul, really break it down, you know, the keys to the fight. I was overruled. George actually, in fact, threatened to walk out live on air. So instead, we're going to look ahead to next weekend, and it really is a street <coughs> of boxing fans, both sides of the Atlantic. But we will start with the return of Josh Taylor, first fight since his unification victory over at Regis Probe last year. Seems a long, long time ago. He takes on Appenon Kong Song. I was going to be mean, Declan, and ask for everything you know about Mr. Kong Song in 30 seconds, but I won't. So I know, George, you were an IBF mandatory. So I know there are exceptions to this rule. Earl Spence being one when he fought Calbrook, but sometimes they're not very good. With all due respect to, to Kong Song, 16 victories, all in Asia, 13 knockouts. Is this mandatory system really as good as it can be? I uh, I didn't even realise it was an IBF mandatory. Um, yeah, the, the thing with the IBF is they do follow um, a, a protocol as, as such for fighters to get their chance. So it is the kind of the easiest... Um, way to fight for a world title without having to, you know, rely on um, other people's connections as such. If you're just just a fighter, um, I remember when I when I boxed uh, when I challenged for the IBF against Carl Froch, I was ranked maybe six in the IBF or something. I wasn't near the top, but um, usually you have to fight your way into place one and two. That's why for years I didn't know why one and two was always vacant. But you have to win a mandatory position to get into a one or two slot. Um, and then they just go through the list. So number three, number four. If number three is fighting number four soon, and number five doesn't want the fight, it dropped down to number six. It's literally whoever's ready to keep the belt active, whoever wants to step up to the plate and have a go, away they go. And you just, um, you, every time you have a, have, a, have a fight, have a win, you draw it to the IBF's attention, say, oh, look, we got another win on the record. And although this, this chap... Um, Kong Song has only had 16 fights, all in his native country, um, not against high opposition. The win, the wins have probably racked, racked up enough on the point scoring system to get him in there. And this is a lovely tick over fight on paper for Josh Taylor right now. Um, he's been, you know, it's clear that he wants to fight Ramirez. He wants to unify, he wants to win all the belts. I think that's even why he's um, signed with Bob Aaron and Top Rank and. Um, those guys to try and make that fight happen, but this will be a fight to to keep busy and not one that I'll be too worried about if I was Josh Taylor. Even though if, I think it's eleven months out of the ring for him now, which is a long time for him. He's been a very active fighter, made um, an incredible um, rise to the top from turning pro. Took took fights, tough fights at early stages of his career. Was happy to always make the jump, going in the World Boxing Super Series, having three high high level fights back to back within any, you know, within I think fifteen, sixteen months and coming out a unified world champion shows that he's up for any challenge. Um but good for him that he's being sort of reined in a little bit here rather than having eleven months out with um the way the world is right now and then going into a big unification fight, he's got a mandatory to get out of the way and get the pressure off. Um so that he can hold on to his IBF belt. <laughs> without getting stripped because he wants to go for a bigger and better fight. I suppose that's the flip side, isn't it, Declan? It is 11 months out. He does have a new trainer in Ben Davison. 
So if it wasn't a mandatory and it was just an opponent, it probably is the perfect, well, maybe not perfect, but it's a, it's a decent fight just to get him back into going through the gears. Yeah, I think George hit the nail on the head by saying it's just a, a good tick over fight because it has been a long time. Kong Song had a he boxed in the summer at some point, I believe. Um, but he's 16 and 0, but same as Josh Taylor. So you know, nobody knows that much about him. There's a bit of footage and stuff. You know, he looks technically decent, but he's never really boxed anyone that anyone's heard of. I think there's a couple on there with winning records. You know, it's, it should be easy pickings really for Josh Taylor. We've said that before about fights and it hasn't turned out like that, but I don't see this being one of them. The, sh- the interesting thing is that is, he is coming off the back of his that big win against Prograde and then he's got a new trainer in his corner. Usually you get a new trainer in the corner once you've been beat, but that's the exact opposite this time. So that's an interesting little vignette. It's interesting to see what Ben Davidson would have done differently, what they'll be working on. Sometimes it doesn't click straight away. Um, and maybe it'll have a, maybe there'll be some ring rust and there'll be a few little teething problems with if there is a new system. I'm sure it, it's not exactly reinventing the wheel with, with Josh Taylor and Ben Davison. I'm sure he won't be revolutionising anything f- at, right now. But, you know, maybe there will be a little bit of a... It will need to take a bit of time to get into that. So, you know, I'm not going to say it's an opportunity for Kong Song, but... Um, but yeah, it's just as well, I would say, that he's not in a pro grey rematch or in a Ramirez unification off the back of this layoff with a new trainer and all those factors. So it's a good time to have this fight. And we've seen it happen before. You mentioned Kel Brook and Errol Spence, but when Kel Brook was taking the mandatories against Jojo Dan and Kevin Bizier and stuff like that, it was like he needed fights and he needed to sell, like, sell some tickets in Sheffield. And uh, there was mandatories lining up, queuing up, and the IBF were more than happy to take the sanctioning fee, get someone in the ring with him. So that's sort of what's happening here. And then, yeah, he, he performs well, hopefully, tries stuff out with Ben Davison, keeps his belt, and then uh, moves on to the big one. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen this happen before. It's, if, you'd, if you'd asked all of us, if you'd asked every boxing fan to write 10 people you want to watch Josh Taylor box, I bet you no one would have written Kong Song in their list, but <laughs> that's just the way it is. It's, it's a good point about Ben Davis and Josh because, as Dex said, he's coming in after Josh Taylor's biggest win, his best win, his unified. It's a strange situation. How is he able to sort of maybe tweak it a little bit and put some of his own you know, knowledge and, and expertise into Josh and, and change a little bit without changing what has basically been a winning machine? Yeah, I, I don't know Ben Davison too well, but I know, obviously, of his reputation – um, relatively young boxing coach uh, in terms of you know his peers and as as coach at the highest level you know working with Tyson Fury and, and other fighters like that so if if I'm Ben Davison you know you've got the unified um, world champion who's just joined you as you say he hasn't he's left he's left his previous situation I mean I don't know but I, not because of problems with his his training you would imagine you know um I was in the gym with him and Shane and they were formidable together um but they, they they've made a change but Ben Ben's really just got to go with what Taylor's got already and as you say there might be some tiny tweaks in there and some slight adjustments to add to his game but he won't be one of me making wholesale changes off the bat I don't think Ben Davison's the sort of trainer who has that insecurity. Lots of trainers do try and make these huge train ch- uh, changes in, in a fight and say, look what I brought, look what I did. Um, but really, you just got to be realistic and like, um, doesn't matter how good a trainer you are, you're not going to be able to make a fighter who can't fight become a world champion. Likewise, if the fighter is already a world champion and a, you know, a great, great fighter, one, probably one of the best pound for pound fighters in the UK right now. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel with him. You just need to harness his strengths, work on his weaknesses, and um, give him the right advice at the right time. You know, and sometimes little, little is better than more. That's not the right saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> more. Whatever that saying is, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, <laughs> Yeah, still ain't got it. What is it? Um, less is more. more less is more. Less is more, yeah. Um, less is more. With, exception with Josh Taylor. I mean, just knowing him, he's um, he's dedicated to his craft and um, he has that personality where he does probably struggle to switch off. You know, he told me stories of being up in his hotel room, shadow boxing at three in the morning. I mean, he probably does more shadow boxing um, 
before he's even got changed when he used to walk through the gym than I do in an entire camp, you know. So um, he can't switch off. To just rein him in is the toughest challenge with um, with Taylor, especially now. I can imagine him being chomping at the bit, being um, just coming off them huge fights in the Super Series, 11 months out, um, twiddling his thumbs. You know, he's now an established world champion. He's, he's going to always want to make a statement. He's always going to want to be the best. Um, that's something that to having a fighter, you never want them to lose. You always want to be able to <clears throat> develop it and harness it. But yeah, so so for for this fight, it'll be um, go out, put together a hundred percent polished performance. Don't make no mistakes, um, and don't worry about being too excited. Um, might, might end up being a, a tough challenge. You might might be tough for him. You know, not not that he'll struggle in this fight, but to look as good as he probably wants to with no crowd at your call, um, you know, against an opposition who probably most people are saying is beneath him. So he's got, he's got it all to do in that respect, Taylor, to come away with a, with a performance that he's happy with. Van Davison the same to come away with a, a polished hundred percent, no mistakes performance. Um, but we'll see. It's interesting. You both mentioned Jose Ramirez, who of course has the other two belts. Now, the spanner in the works there could be Jack Catroff, who's the WBO mandatory, and everybody, WBO. Uh, Jack, of course, Frank Warren, FDK, all seem to be pushing him towards the Ramirez fight. From a selfish point of view, I hope that happens first, because if Josh Taylor fights Jose Ramirez in Las Vegas, and 10,000 Scots can't go over and take over, then, then there's something wrong there. But it's almost a, a mini Fury Joshua situation, really, if you think of Catroff as Usyk. Bear with me, and you know we're not going to get the, the unification fight because because we might have this other fight. But Taylor may well have to wait into what next summer before he gets that fight he really wants. Yeah, I I wouldn't be surprised if it's not the, the next one after this. You know what, how it works, especially with like big fights, big names. Um, I would not be surprised at all if Catterall fights Ramirez first. I w- Catterall's a good fighter, but I don't I, I don't see him beating Ramirez. Who knows? But then. Then it would be the next one, and like you say, you know, when we're talking about like five, six months usually between fights, it could be like a year or so until that happens, and then who knows what happens then? Taylor could lose at some point, or someone gets injured. You know, it's it's just sad, isn't it? That it works like that, but I think all boxing fans accept that, and um, yeah, I wouldn't be holding your breath too soon about Ramirez Taylor, although that's clearly the path. There's going to be little potholes. Catterall might throw a real spanner in the works. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, you've got to back them both to win all their fights, really, until, until they get it, get it on. And the same as you would with Fury and Joshua, or you would have done. And then Andrew Ruiz turned up. And, you know, you can see how it all falls apart pretty easily. So, um, yeah, that said, I don't see Taylor having a problem this weekend. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, and neither do Betfair. Josh Taylor is thirty-three to one on to beat mm. Hong Song, who is twelve What's to one. What's the draw? The draw is, I believe, I'm joking. Years. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you are incredibly rich or you've had too much to drink, I imagine you believe in that alone. Uh, Charlie Edwards makes his debut for Frank Warren on the undercard. His first fight since his no decision slash defeat to Julio Cesar Martinez. And a nice little fight on the undercard, I suspect, will be David Oliver Joyce against Inut Bolta. Bolta beat TJ Doheny last time, who lost narrowly to a Roman, no, Daniel Roman, in his career. So that could be, that's probably the best 50 50 fight on that card Saturday night, York Hall on BT Sport. Moving over to Germany, we have the long delayed WBSS World Boxing Super Series cruiserweight final between Junior Dortikos and Marius Bredis. Really, the cruiserweight division, well, it was made for the World Boxing Super Series. This is the second time they've done this. Almost a completely new cast. These two, I believe, were in the first series. We're into the final. George, the cruiserweights just deliver every single time. Yeah, they do. Definitely for the World Boxing Super Series. And um, <clears throat> they had all the best fighters in there in season one. They had all the world title belts. Um, it was a, a terrific success. Um, and Usyk came out on top, and then for me, I was like, "Oh, this might be the problem with the with with the series is that 
Usyk's completed boxing now. He's and you're not supposed to be able to complete boxing. You know, he's 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 come through this tournament within twelve months. He's on top. He's got all the belts, and the only thing left for him to do would be to to move up uh, and try heavyweights. Um, speaking with Callis Howland, who's um, I'm not sure his official role at World Boxing Series, but he's um, definitely on the on the. Um, He's the, the boxing guy on the on the floor who makes makes the fights makes makes it happen. And I asked him, "What? Why are you doing cruiserweights again? Like Usyk's completed it." And he's like, "Well, he's moving out. All the belts are coming vacant, and there's there's enough competition, and the fights are great. Plus, they do like a couple of big guys in there. So um, he came again. And I think these two were the the, the two, two of the best of you know who didn't didn't quite get to the final in the first series." Um, Breedis especially, um, very good fighter. Um, pushed Usyk hard in, in, in the first series. And it just feels like this... Uh, I wasn't sure whether this final was ever going to take place. It's um, It's been a long time coming. I haven't got the, the date, the original date written down, but it must be pushed back. I think it's been rearranged several times. Um, and luckily, happily for the boxing fans, finally going to take place this weekend. I mean, it didn't help that in the semi-final... When Gassiev and Golov, oh, hang on, Babaki, that's the one. Sorry, very controversial. It, was, it definitely wasn't Golov. We'll come to him later. Uh, that semi-final, very controversial. Uh, Bradish was throwing elbows. He then knocked down Glavaki after the bell, and then stopped him the next round. The rematch was actually ordered by the WBO, but because Bradish is in the WBSS, he had to vacate that belt, which is why it's just the just the IBF and the ring actually on the line this weekend. Deca very much a clash of styles, Dorticus. Reach advantage, Bredis, that little bit more in your face. Yeah, I would say Dorticus, bigger, the bigger sort of one-punch guy out of the two as well. Um, I think it's a great fight. That was the, the thing, like what George mentioned about the cruiserweights, it was sort of like the whole context of this. It was like, well, I've still the best of the rest because Usyk's gone. It's like, why are we doing this again? Because, you know, Usyk's clearly the best cruiserweight. He's gone, maybe give it a year. But it's delivered again. Um, if I if I was putting money on it, I put I would probably back door to cost big win against Andrew Tabiti. You know, um, it's just it's one of those. It's sort of the backdrop for all of these fights at the moment. It's sort of who has been who has been most affected by the big layoff because we, they've all had to deal with it. Who who's been in the gym? Who hasn't? Who's been motivated? Who hasn't? I wouldn't question either of their motivations at all. Um, it's strange with the Super Series because of contractual stuff and injuries. That was all the, always the thing that people would use as a bit of a stick to beat it. You know, it can't it can't run smoothly because someone would get injured and something. Nobody thought a pandemic would come and put like a year or whatever it is between the between the semis and the final. But it's finally here. Um, I thought Dortikos was it, it, the first one. The first go round was just a little bit too early for him amongst such big names like Gassiev and Usyk and stuff like that. But having that experience from the first tournament and coming into it now with Usyk gone, uh, yeah, I thought it was a perfect, perfect place for him to prove that he's, he's the best, best of the rest, as it were, or the best of the cruiserweights as it stands. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be a great fight while it lasts. Um, yeah, Braid has got that sort of pressure, that real pressure, and it might play into Dortikos' hands a little bit, literally. Um, yeah, I'm fine. It's, glad it's finally here. Um, Interesting to see where the where the super series goes from from here as well because um, it has had you know you can't call them teething problems anymore but it has had issues um, and it's about how they find them out. Um, it, it seems to be the perfect formula for making great fights, but the longer it's gone on, the more stuff has popped up. Like managers and um, promoters and stuff now thinking, is it the best thing for my fighter? You know, is the money there? All that sort of stuff. So interesting to see how it develops from here in into the next season. I think there are probably only certain weight <laughs> divisions you can do it at as well. I mean, well, you could do it at any weight division, obviously, but there's no point doing a heavyweight one if you don't have any world champions or you don't have Dubois or Joyce. So I guess they're restricted. And I guess if you look at the cruiserweights, it's quite an unfashionable division, I would argue. The smaller guys, quite unfashionable. You're not going to get the best welterweights, I imagine. Well, they can't fight each other anyway, never mind. No. Sign up to a tournament. So I guess, assuming they do it again, George, it might have to be same divisions again yeah yeah maybe i mean when they um i think it was it was it bantam or super bantam i think it was bantam when it came out of bantam weights and it ended up being 
oh, what a division, like what what yeah, tremendous insane, fight. Yeah. But off the, off the bat, originally you're like, I don't wait, so I really want to uh, pursue this. Ultimately, what the what the boxing series that their their problem will be is it's so much money up front before they build that brand that fighters actually just want to be a part of it. They just want to win that trophy. Um, you know, there's, you know, you, as a fighter, you might, you, it never happens, but you might get offered more money to fight for a, a WBU or an IBF than you would fight for a WBC, but you'd want to fight for WBC because it's such a prestigious belt. Um, that's what they're trying to build with the world boxing series. Um, they want it to be the champions league, of boxing as such, but to get that and to guarantee the the fights and get the big names in there, the world champions in there, they've got to you know guarantee huge uh, huge purses. Um, and even then, a lot of especially the American fighters are reluctant to sign away a deal where they might be fighting three times, or they obviously hope to fight three times, even though they're going to come out with loads of money and maybe all the belts. But they just don't want to take that risk. They'd rather have the option to have an easier fight or an easier you know, defense for lesser money, a bit more time to, uh, to make the fights. But it's a, I think it's a great idea. It's a great concept. And imagine if they did have enough money um, to, you know, try and try and secure all the heavyweights out of there right now. You go, right. So uh, we want um, Fury, Joshua, um, you know, Usyk, um, Maybe Dubois and Joyce if they're ready, or you know who else, whoever else, um, Wilder, Wilder in the mix. So uh, the money they're going to generate loads of money because who's not going to want to watch these guys fight each other? And if you're guaranteed to see um, Joshua versus Fury, providing they deserve to be in the final because they've got to fight their way there in the first place, you're going to have all the belts. You're finally going to have um, a unified heavyweight world champion. Um, you know these guys. Could, who knows what they could what they could be guaranteed? They could be guaranteed a hundred million dollars for the, for the winner in the final, and maybe that's not enough. Maybe it generates more. But um, the the winning formula of a World Series that I learned was people like a fixture list. People, especially that's what you don't have in boxing. So you you anticipate. Josh was going to fight Fury, but it might never happen. And um, you get fed up with boxing. But if you know these two chaps win and they're going to fight one weekend apart in a semi-final, um, and then we've only got three, four months to wait for a final, even if there's an injury and it's like gets um, delayed or whatnot, you still adamant that this is going to happen. You know, um, there's definitely a lot of curveballs. I think even the series didn't, uh, envision um, having to deal with like a, p- a potential disqualification that isn't a disqualification and then they order a rematch and one of the belts has to get vacated I think they're adamant that they wanted each series to last no longer than a calendar year but asking fighters to have three substantial fights within a year um, is tough going you know when some of the, the elite only fight once a year twice a year maximum so that that stuff, but I think if they get their head around that this doesn't have to be necessarily an annual thing, they definitely didn't need to have three weight divisions running this time. I think they gave themselves too much work. I think two two is enough, um, and then work on securing the best fighters in the world because you could get the best welterweights weights in the world if you if you if you guarantee if, you, if you're going to put the money up for them, and then the promoters that are working with these guys, they know if they back their guy and they come out on top that's the thing with the series, you know, after a year, they let you go, (laughs) you know, and as a promoter, you know, you could be an Al Heyman or Bob Arum or a Ludabella or someone like that. And you've got a fighter and you stick them in there and they come out with all the world titles, but then you've just got, you know, such a prestigious product that you haven't necessarily had to do any work for. So it, it makes, I think the competition makes an awful lot of sense. Um, I hope that it just doesn't run out of steam, run out of money, run out of, whatever it, it does that makes it um, not be a thing anymore. Um, and I think I think maybe just um, a big injection of money and we just go for some big names, get some world weights, maybe go for the world weights or someone like that. You know, you want 
you stick a Pacquiao in there or something like that, and maybe you can't nail them down to a fixed fee. There's like some sort of side deal where they're on a percentage of the pay-per-view buyers or something, which I know that um, the series wasn't interested in, and many fighters are not interested in. You know, if you're going to get paid pay-per-view money and it doesn't matter whether it sells or not, then you're happy to sign a dotted line as long as you've got the cojones to go in there and fight anyone, whoever they sign up with. So... Um, it's interesting. It just depends. I think it just depends on the fighters. But um, I mean, you look at Josh Taylor. You know, it, it's been it's been a, what a what a dream competition for him to come along at that at that stage of his career where um, it might he might have to wait two years for a chance fighter for a world title, and then within twelve months he's a unified world champion. Um, three big fights, three huge paydays. Uh, being talked about as pound for pound the best fighter in the UK, and promoted right in the right uh, fight. He is a, a pay-per-view fighter now in the UK, certainly, because who, you know, we ain't got that many other fighters who are boxed at that level have been that successful. So um, I hope, I <laughs> hope it may, hope it does all right. I hope it, hope it continues. Um, be interesting. I haven't spoke to Cal or any of the guys from the, from, from the world boxing series, see who they're going to go after next, what weights they're going to go after. But there is talk that there will be a, a third instalment, a third series. So it'd be silly now if they stop after, you know, the amount of money they've spent, but also the, the good work that, that they've done, the, the 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 high quality fights they've managed to put together. Maybe one for Saudi Arabia, happy to throw money at boxing. So with the site fee, maybe that's that's the way to go down. Just set up camp for, for a year in Saudi Arabia and just, just fight and fight and fight. Yeah, I think... Um... Personally, uh, speaking out of turn, I thought they 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 got it wrong. So they put my final in in Saudi because they wanted to be pioneering and be the first um, company to put on a you know a major boxing event in that region of the world. They obviously got a huge site fee. They probably didn't back. I don't know. I don't know what the fees were, and I don't know whether it was just the beginning of a, of an existing agreement that they wanted to to. Um, to manage but the fact that I boxed um, Chris Eubank Jr and it was a sellout um, at the Manchester Arena um, done huge numbers on ITV which you know 10 times more than ITV have ever done before and probably if it will do since I don't even think that they've pulled out of pay-per-view boxing now so they could have used that momentum to um, really um, <clears throat> develop a huge domestic final in the UK that would have got huge traction here in the UK would have reverberated out across Europe and the States. And it kind of went under the radar, um, being in Saudi, um, good for me cause I didn't win, <laughs> but, um, I think, uh, they, they definitely missed the trick there. Um, you know, uh, I don't, I want, I want more fights in the UK. I know they're going to, I know that, Every now and again and throughout history has happened. You see these big fights that are in obscure locations because, you know, some government or some company or someone's paying a huge site fee for it. But um, you need the big fights here in the UK or in the States or in the places that the fans can get to see and enjoy it, talk about, relive experience and um, just um, adds value to the business, adds value to the sport and makes it... um, um, a commodity for the future. Yeah, difficult to disagree. If, like Deck, you fancy Dorscus to win, he is 64, the underdog actually, with Betfair. Bradus 13 to 8 on for the Cruiserweight final. Yeah, I'm going Bradus. I'm going Bradus, I think. Oh, wow. Ooh. There we go. Yeah. He was out. Uh, Chris Bellum Smith was out sparring with him. I think before, not this time, but before one of his, one, one of the fights to come out, and he said, um, Chris learned a lot. Chris is Chris is one of the most improved cruiserweights here in the UK. Um, Billum Smith, now the Commonwealth champion, but he learned a lot on that trip. Um, he said he's a cool guy and uh, he's, he's a good fighter. I think um, I like I like he's definitely, that. He's little... definitely the most seasoned of the two, isn't he? He's definitely yeah. the most seasoned one, and you can see why 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 he'd be a favourite. I just got a, f- a sneaky feeling about Dawes Cross. Well, it's good to have a fight. It's a bit tasty. If not 50-50, at least it's closer than other ones we have discussed. Finally, on Saturday night, over in America with the Charlo twins headlining a joint pay-per-view. Jamar Charlo, middleweight against 
Sergei Delimenchenko, who was involved in a fight with Gennady Golovkin, one of the first shows we did actually, WBC middleweight title on the line. Delimenchenko's third attempt to win a world title, having lost a split decision to Daniel Jacobs, and then of course, Nali to Golovkin. A lot of people thought he won that fight. I can't see this being a bad fight, Declan. No, this is a great fight. One of the, I say, one of the best of the year. I mean, it's, it's not much in in twenty twenty, but yeah, it's a great fight in terms of like when you look down the schedule. It's a real one that stands out. Even though Der Derry Venchenko's record is not, you know, numerically not great, this would be Jamal Charlo's best win. Um, it's a great style matchup as well. Um, yeah, really good. Proper middleweight title fight, like really good. But the only thing, I can't work out if the Charlos are, are totally mad, are ge genuinely totally mad or really intelligent or what. They're, they're really, I really like, you can't, you can't dislike them when it comes to like the characters they are and the sp what they bring to the sport. And I love a night when they both box. Um, I remember when they first sort of were breaking through when they were sort of 18, 19, 20 and 0. There was talk that actually them being twins was a bit of a hindrance because no one knew. They, and obviously they're called Jamal and Jamel. Like no one could tell the difference between the two. You know, actually, although it was like a gimmick, it, it started becoming a bit of a thing where one, neither of them could really establish themselves. But I think they're doing that now. This sort of a win for Jamal would be, would be massive. Um, I think they both have their um, flaws as well. They're not, obviously they're both lost for a start, but you know, they're not, they're not perfect. Um, but what they do, what they can do is really fight and they're both really skillful. Um, trying to think when, was it Jamel? Or no, it was Jamal who knocked out Julian Williams. It was amazing. You know, he sort of caught, caught a jab, caught the jab on the backhand and then delivered an uppercut with the same hand. It was like really, you know, they're really talented guys. Um, this is, yeah, this is a great fight and, the, and Jamel's in a great fight as well. So this is... This is the sort of thing that promoters would have thought when they first saw these guys, thought well, we could do big nights with a pair of them and, you know, one box in, what, it, that, that's sort of coming to fruition now. And I think it's what the sports need. A couple of outspoken Americans barking at the press, you know, wearing mad stuff. Um, yeah, really looking forward to both fights. So as Dick mentioned, both Charlo brothers in action, Jamel Charlo takes on Jason Rosario, WBC, WBA and IBF. Super welterweight titles on the line. Charlo won his belt back, beating Tony Harrison last time out in a rematch. Rosario has a win over Julian Williams earlier this year. George, again, maybe that fight is not quite as close as the as the other one, but we're looking forward to two big fights. Yeah, yeah, it looks a great fight. Great fight on paper. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, how many times have these guys box on the same show? Like co-main events do they do they do we know do they have the same training team they've got the same trainers do they work they work together a lot i'm sure i've read that they never never do train together no Is and they right? often, they're not often boxing together because you usually one of them's behind the other one shouting stuff isn't they so it's good good to get them on the boat on the same car but in big both in big fights it's interesting isn't it see how they yeah 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 i think that's that's really interesting then because um I'm sure they, they, they back each other and there might be a slight competitive element as who wants to impress more. But also if they do, um, I didn't know whether they train together and have the same, the same team and set up, like um, what's, what's the, that there's a logistics issue there. Who's going to, you know, when you're getting warmed up in the change room and you know, we don't want your brother out there in a, in a fight of his life and he's, you know, he's struggling on in there and you've got a ring walk 10 minutes later. Um, I always find that, that stuff really interesting. Um, I think I think great great card two two great fights. Um, Derinchenko I think is um, definitely an underrated fighter. Um, record isn't as good as um, you know his, his his ability and definitely his performances. Um, wouldn't surprise me if he pushed him all the way. If, um, if that that's that's the fight that that goes a bit a bit peak tongue um, for the Charlo brothers. Um, yeah, Jason Rosario as well. He's he got the biggest shock of the year so far. Well, in, in January, that was a massive win that he got out of nowhere against Julian Williams, who himself had won the belt in a in a bit of a shock against Jarrett Hurd. So it sort of shows how close that division is, how interesting it is. Also, I noticed yesterday on his box rec, Jace, to give him his full name, Jason Manuel Rosario Bastardo, and his nickname is Banana. So what's not <laughs> to like about Jason Rosario? So that's... Uh, that's an interesting one. 
Uh, again, Jamel's big favourite, but yeah, don't write him off. Both, you know, who knows? I don't know what the price will be, but for both twins to lose on the same night, I reckon you get a pretty tasty double price on that. Well, just to run through the prices, Jamel, Char- Jamel, Jamel Charlo is 9-2 to two on to beat Jason Rosario, who's 3-1. to one. So if you do fancy the upset, he does there. Jamal Charlo is 7-4 to four on to beat Derevchenko, who is 11-8. to eight. It's a bit tighter on the odds there. That is, in fact, us for this week. Plenty of previews, which means next weekend, plenty of reviews and looking ahead to what's next for all the winners and losers. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, George. Thank you all for tuning in. And please do you should so probably thank your, um, thank your canvases as well, because none of them fell down this week. So Yeah, listen, I had a strong that. word with them, actually. I, I told them, listen, just behave. You've got one hour, one job, just get it done. And, and listen, they've, they've done well. They've done well. They, they're going to stay in place. I reckon from now on, if one drops out, it gets replaced by, by something else. That's a good shout. That's, that's, that's probably it. And if you're listening not watching it's the cut you know just check it out youtube there's there's another reason to check us out on youtube but anyway thank you for tuning in and please as i said do so again next week